Okay, Searle part two, and then onward and upward. So I just talked about extension. The other way that you can connect a name to an object according to Searle is by description. So in other words, I can um, describe something in great detail and at great length, and that will help us understand why the na this name is connected to this object. So on the top of page 50 on the left hand side, here's another really good passage um, that Searle is using to problematize things. And I like it because these are great, good examples. Um, do we really want to say that the name Aristotle denotes no objects? If, for example, I'm starting to quote now, we challenge his statement by pointing out that a man named Aristotle lived in Hoboken in 1903, we would not regard, he would not regard this as a relative, relevant countercharge. We say of Cerberus and Zeus that neither of them ever existed without meaning that no object ever bore these names, but only that certain kinds, descriptions of objects never existed and bore those names. Right, so he gives us wonderful examples all the way through. I really like that Aristotle being in Hoboken, right? You had these questions of like, what if Aristotle was an alligator? Or what if Shakespeare never wrote Hamlet, right? So how do we cope with these counter examples to our descriptions? Um, the sentence, Scott is the author of Waverly, which is a famous example that's used over and over in these writings, uh, both refers to Scott and refers to Waverly, the literary work, um, but it also describes Scott as something. And this is, again, we will get into this much more when we do Bertrand Russell. Um, but he's just saying, look, we've really got to be careful because sure, we can point out an object, sure, we can describe an object, but as you describe an object, you have to realize that different names um, are connected to different descriptions. And so descriptions might be different in the minds of different people, something that Frege doesn't completely confront. And so we need to worry about descriptions fixing the reference. Um, one of the other things that Searle does in this article is he gives a shout out to Wittgenstein because he talks about how names are used um, and says that it's important that we look at how they're used in order to understand what names are. So he's concerned about how names function in a language. And when we get to Wittgenstein later on, you'll see that theory uh, bloom and become really fleshed out. But there's sort of a, um, a warning here or a precursor here of what is to come. Onward and upward. Kripke's causal theory will go against everything that we have just said. So here is the debate. And this is why I asked you to read so many articles, is that you get this beginning notion of sense and reference um, and description, all different ways to understand what names mean. And Kripke comes by and says, nope, this doesn't work at all. Names are not descriptions. Their names do not have a sense. Their meaning comes from a dubbing ceremony or a baptism. So we're back in a way to toward Mill, right? Toward looking at simply as, as names as simply being denotative or referential and nothing else. So there's a very reference, this is a very reference heavy view with an emphasis on the act of dump, dub, dubbing, dumping, bleh, dubbing. Um, ostension is very, very important. The intention of the dubber and the understanding of the audience is very important. So we don't leave the realm of the mental altogether, but we're definitely fixated on pointing acts in the physical world as being the thing that brings meaning to a name. So why does Kripke, why is he motivated to get away from the sense theory or notions of connotation for a name? Well, he's a modal logician, so he's concerned about questions of what is true in every possible world and what is true in some possible worlds and what is merely possible. So he's he wants us to be able to talk intelligently about individuals across possible worlds. So his whole jive is transworld identification. He wants to know exactly the kinds of questions that Searle was bringing up is, what if Aristotle was born in Hoboken in 1903, right? What if he wasn't the, the dude who taught Alexander, right? We could imagine like if you 
if you just walk into a nice ontology for yourself where you have souls that can be incarnated at any time. So the thing that is Aristotle's soul was not born in ancient Greece, it was born in Hoboken. Um, but we still want to point to that particular soul, even though it did not do all the same things as the other things, um, right? This, this is what he's trying to do with the name, is make it hook specifically to an individual, no matter what that individual does. So we can talk about Nixon, even if he uh, was never almost impeached. We can talk about Trump, even if he did not become president, right? Uh, we want to pick out individuals across possible worlds. Kripke's classical examples are the Aristotle who never taught Alexander, or the Hitler who really just went to art school and didn't lead the Third Reich, because maybe we could talk about him. And in fact, if you're into good science fiction, this is everywhere, right? What if, what if you lived in a different time and were a slightly different self, and none of the things that are commonly used to describe you actually describe you? What if Shakespeare did not write Hamlet? We still want to be able to talk about Shakespeare. So for those reasons, right, by these counterexamples, Kripke argues that descriptions do not pick out the individual, but names need to, or all of our all, all of our counterfactual discourse, all of our sci-fi discourse are not, is not going to work out. And hey, we're almost done, gang. On to Quine. I love Quine. You've probably met Quine somewhere else, but here is the basic story behind ontological relativity. I assign it in this name section specifically because he's going to problematize uh, the kind of general names that uh, Mill is bringing up. So imagine that you're an anthropologist and that your assignment is to go to visit a tribe who speaks a language that has been um, completely untranslated before they've had no contact with the outside world. So this tribe speaks a language and your job is to make the dictionary. So you arrive on day one and a man comes out of his hut. He points to a rabbit hopping up a hill and yells Gavagai. Great. So you have some evidence that Gavagai means rabbit, but you've got to keep testing. So you keep testing. So day two, you are observing the tribe. A woman walking into the hut see, points at a rabbit who is hopping across a field and says Gavagai. You go, ah, more evidence that Gavagai means rabbit, right? Life is great. It looks like Gavagai is going to mean rabbit. You run all of your controlled tests. They say Gavagai when they're pointing to rabbits on cloudy days, on sunny days. Children use the term. Uh, men and women use the term. Elders use the term, right? It seems that Gavagai means rabbit. But Quine says it's very hard to be certain that Gavagai means rabbit because principles of individuation are impossible to a certain among minds. So in other words, while we think that Gavagai means rabbit, the, the tribal people might think that Gavagai means platonic instant, instantiation of platonic rabbithood, right? The, the imperfect instance of perfect rabbithood, or it might be time slice of rabbit, or it might be um, undifferentiated rabbit parts or undivided rabbit parts, right? So how do we know that they mean rabbit when they say Gavagai? Maybe they mean something else that is ultimately empirically equivalent to rabbit. That is, they're pointing to Gavagai, which means time slice of transdimensional trans rabbithood, and we just mean rabbit the animal. How are you ever going to tell that apart? Because we're always going to point to rabbit, right? So we can't develop tests to know what the cognitive content is in someone else's head. Right. So this is a problem, not just for the tribe where you don't have any native speakers and you have to go in uh, into this case of radical translation, it's called, and try to develop a dictionary. This is true for something as simple as English and French. Right. How do we know? How do we know that the French individuate the world in the same way that native English speakers individuate the world? And in fact, there are arguments that they don't. Right that um, because English is missing terms like joie de vivre, right, or savoir-faire, 
right? If we do not have these things in English, we actually need to borrow from French in order to get that concept because we don't have that concept living in our silly little English speaking heads. Um, likewise, the German word Schadenfreude is a great term, uh, meaning being pleased at the failure of your enemies or your rivals. Um, we understand that when it's explained to us, but we don't have it as a category of being quite the way the Germans do. So um, it's very possible that translation does not work out as well as we think it does. And you know, you, you do see people arguing about problems with translated works and that the meaning doesn't really carry through or that there are all these subtle cultural nuances that are left behind. Ultimately, Quine is suggesting that translation is fundamentally indeterminate, not only across languages, not only in cases of radical translation where no one speaks the language, but across languages like English and French and German and Spanish and so on, but also between individual minds. So we're down to that wonderful, how do I know that when I use the word blue, it means the same as when you use the word blue, because maybe what's going on in your mind is that you're individuating the world primarily and fundamentally differently from the way I individuate the world. Um, this, so we, we, we're not even sure that meaning transfers among minds of people who are speaking the same language much less translation between different language. Because of this is the indeterminacy, breathe Sarah, the indeterminacy of translation is based on his notion of the inscrutability of reference. The inscrutability of reference is this idea that perhaps it is a rabbit or perhaps it is an instantiation of perfect platonic rabbithood or it is a time slice of rabbit, right? How do I know exactly what that referent is? So if names get their meanings partially or wholly through reference, and we individuate the world completely differently, then there is no way that we will ever discover the meaning of something as simple as a name. And so at the end of the article, Quine calls for us to abandon this notion that there is like a museum of meanings, like a platonic heaven where all the real correct meanings of all the words are. And if only we could go look, then we could go get the meaning because there isn't one. There are individual minds. The individual minds might individuate the world in exactly the same way, or they might not, right? We might have radical problems with how each of us individuates the world, and we might individuate it very, very differently. Um, so that makes reference completely inscrutable. That makes translation fundamentally indeterminate. And if translation is indeterminate, then it seems like all that we have as a criteria for meaning is if it works. So we collapse into pragmatism. There is no talking about semantics at all, or at least there's no talking about semantics based on reference at all. Um, so we may not be talking with each other. Um, there probably is no core meaning of language, but if I give you 250 and you give me a slice of pizza, or let me give you a better example. If I give you $5 and 65 cents and I get a latte, right? Then language works as well as it's ever gonna work. And, and we have our meanings as well as we will ever have our meanings but we haven't accessed cognitive content. We haven't accessed ideas of another human being. We have only successfully completed a transaction. All right, gang, that's, that's most of it. I'll come up with discussion questions real soon, but not on Saturday.